Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, hey, Paul. We, um, you know, several times I say we have sort of a different show, but this is really a different kind of show. Terry and I are going to be doing it together. And a podcaster that I like, Tim Ferriss, that probably many listeners are familiar with, has an annual show that he calls The Random Show. And I think his guest is his friend, Kevin Rose. And what they do is they get out a couple of bottles of wine or a bottle of whiskey, and they just chat about whatever comes up. There is no topic. There's no theme. There's no movement or direction. They're just talking about ideas. And I thought, you know, that could be a fun thing to do with Terry. So what I thought we would do today is that we would have a friends chat in an episode that um, I've thought about calling Just Saying. And although I have a list of things I'd like to talk about, no subject is off limits and we don't have to talk about what I suggest. We'll just let's see what happens. Now, if you're a frequent listener to the show, then you're familiar with Terry Hershey, who is a very regular speaker. And if you don't know Terry, he is a prolific writer, conference keynote speaker, renowned landscape architect, and spiritual advisor. And I think we will probably dabble in each one of those subjects. So let's bring our special guest. Yo, Hershey, what's up? Charles, how are you? I am good. Why are you chuckling? You're chuckling because the, the setup, want to know what I can pour you, the two bottles of wine part, see? So we're talking my language there. I know. For you, we can't do that, but... Yeah, you yeah. could pour me a $300 bottle of Pinot Noir, and I may um, <laughs> I may break my sobriety. Uh, when you were giving that introduction, I went ahead and poured a glass of dry sherry, which is what I drink for See, that's for you sippers. For me, that's just one gulp. <laughs> you know. Oh no! Oh my lord! Dry sherry is heaven. It literally, you are. You close your eyes and you think, okay, now I know why heaven exists. Okay, so here's where I want to start, Terry. I want to start with a bit of sort of dancing around theology. I know you love saying you're not a theologian, but that's a bunch of garbage. You know, you've got a master's degree in theology, and you've got 40 years of influencing literally tens of thousands of Christian women and men. And I think that qualifies you as to um, have an acute understanding of what I like your theology. It's not doctrinal as much as it is something about the everydayness the everydayness of our spirituality and how it impacts our life it's very practical yet also yet also honoring of the divine it's a it's it's a not what you would typically call theologian from the seminary, but it's a theologian of life. Would Does that define you a bit? Or describe yeah. you? I don't like so, define yeah. you. So, yeah. Describe so my, you a my, bit. Uh, yeah. First reaction to that is that I'm smiling because the what, what the, your setup for the show about what we were going to do and talk about finds, describes every dinner you and I have had over the last 40 years. I know, I know, doesn't it? It did, and that's what I, that's what I thought about. It would be like dinner, and, and hopefully we won't have our moments, moments that we both totally enjoy that I think is a um, hallmark of a great friendship, and that we can have dinners and have a minimum of five minutes of silence where we don't feel like we have to interject anything. We can just enjoy the dinner, and then a topic will come up. I think that's, I think that's a sign of a good friendship that is comfortable with silence with each other that doesn't have to fill the space with noise. Yeah, and it, cause I'm, I'm thinking about the theology. When I was, of course, well, I was raised in a, in a religion that required you to have the right answers. 
that's the irony of theology to have the right answers and even when I went to seminary I had a class I don't even remember the name of the class but it was something about I was going to say it was something about God <laughs> <laughs> well kind of that's what theology is about <laughs> yeah but anyway I, the, you ready for this the final exam you had to write a paper literally proving the existence of God was your paper <laughs> Not joking. That was your paper. Uh, oh, and you re- remember, Anselm. These are you know these are throwbacks for people who remember people who actually spent their life describing philosophically the existence of God. Yeah, they were proving it. They had to prove it. Yeah. Well, it's it's that it's that it's that post enlightenment yeah, right, right brain our left brain Newtonian thinking. Exactly, and so. This teacher had us write a paper to prove the existence of God. And I still own that paper. I mean, I own, but I own, I mean, in a file, and I pull it out, and I think to myself, Lord Jesus, have mercy. <laughs> then, because my favorite, my favorite theologian is a man named Robert Capon. And he said, we're so inculcated, the flubs that will get us in Dutch. We never hear the music, we only play the right notes. Yeah, yeah. And and speaking of speaking to, of playing piano, when he wrote that, yeah, exactly. And if you if you want to know me as a theologian, that's me. Okay, you know what I want I to would, talk about. Here's what I want to talk about. I I just wrote something. I may write a write a blog about. You know, I just. I have little essays that I write here and there and here and there, and sometimes they, they turn into publish, and most times they don't. But it was, I titled it The Unbelievable, Belief in the Unbelievable. There's something about the monotheistic, real, well, I'm sure it's all religions, that there is an adherence, a belief, a clinging to... Things that are unbelievable in the in the Christian faith, in the Christian faith, you know, we have plenty in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, you know, we have things like Trinity, and no one can explain it. You know, try to explain it about a three leaf clover. That's silly, or an egg. That's silly. You know, there's 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 something mystical and transcendent that's going on between the essence of love between three personas of the trinity that come out as one but that's but that's that's sort of unbelievable and then we have like god actually becoming a human being and then being killed for it and then you have virgin birth and then you have resurrection where a dead guy gets up and walks and changes the world. Those are those are pretty, you know. If if you go by the Newtonian paradigm in proof and statistics and validity, you cannot prove any of those. All of those are, uh, well, are, are not, yeah, but not just not just virgin birth, Charlie. Her mom had to be a virgin, so it's virgin mom's birth. It's like okay. I, um, I tell me the answer again. Tell me the answer again. Well, I was I was telling you this because this this I've written about theology in my book in my in my blog Sabbath Moment. Right. I quoted I've quoted from this book that, by a guy named Robert Benson. So I'm trying to explain people. But I don't have a quote statement of faith. His statements of faith are kind of odd to me. Anyway, so this is what Benson, I'm going to, I, I pulled this up because I want to read this. And he said, uh, uh, this, he's talking about his Sunday school teacher, Hazelyn McComas. He, and I'm, I'm quoting from him. Kind and gentle woman, a teacher, a woman of prayer, a woman whose spirit bears witness to her having spent a life seeking for glimpses of and listening for whispers of God. Than the ancient prayer of the chosen people. She's the Sunday school teacher. There's always a kid in the class who considers it his charge to trap the teacher. Benson remembers one occasion when the teacher was challenged about the veracity of the faith. In other words, all the statements you just made, right? 
Yeah, and veracity mean the truthfulness, yeah. Is this real? Is this, this really happened? Blah, blah, blah. I remember that she drew a breath and straightened up a bit, as though she wanted to be firm and clear, not harsh and critical, and she said, this is what I believe. We were with God in the beginning. I do not understand that exactly. We looked like we did all day, how we got along, any of it. Then we were sent here. And I'm not sure that I understand that very well either. And I believe that we were, I believe that we are going home to God someday. And what that will be like is as much a mystery to me as any of the rest of it. I believe those things are true and that what we have here on earth in between the longing for the God that we have known and the God that we are going home to, thus learn to go home. It's a very experiential kind of faith. Exactly. It's, it's literally visceral. And, yes. and okay, if we're going to get theological, incarnational, very flesh. It's flesh. It's now. Do you, do you know there's um, Joseph Campbell, Richard Rohr, you know, Joseph yes. Campbell being the, the hero, the hero, the heroine uh, journey, Richard Rohr, very strong man of faith, but is very right brain thinking rather than left brain. And the churches and that you week, and I his were... Whole week, Go ahead. This whole week has been about trying to describe the the the, the uh, Trinity, but keep going, yeah. Oh, has it? Um, yeah. yeah, Bonaventure is where my go-to for understanding the Trinity mm -hmm. and... And it's all relational. So where was I in Richard? Oh, oh, you, you know, there, there, there are there are basically two radical camps that that I fit somewhere in the middle of. And one camp is the unbelievable, miraculous. You know, do you call virgin birth miracle? You know, I don't know that's miracle, but that's it certainly unbelievable, uncomprehensible. And and there are those that believe that you you must you must embrace the you must embrace the truth of that in order for it to be real. If you can't embrace the truth, then the reality is not is not so. But if you study the history of faith and you study the history of translation of scripture, you know, the historicity is really unprovable. You can't prove anything. I may believe in the veracity of something because only because I choose to believe it, Terry. I have I have I have no data no data upon except for what is called Holy Writ, except for, you know, the Bible or the Koran or, or the Hebrew Bible for, um, for the Jewish faith. And, you know, and that is, that is a text in and of itself. You know, there's, there's not a lot of, uh, there's commentaries, but there aren't accepted alternative sources. There's only one source, and it, it explains the truth I like, I believe in a lot of these things because I choose to believe in them. You know, I, I choose to believe in the virgin birth. Now, can I, if someone says, can you prove that? I said, absolutely not. Wouldn't. Yeah, but so, look, so let me ask you this. So, but believing in it, what's that do for you, your spirit? My spirit, it accentuates the God that does not have to live in a human box set of required behaviors. Okay, so it, it does something to your spirit having nothing to do with whether or not anyone else need to believe it or not believe it. Exactly. Exactly. So that but that's a big deal. And you do you know the number of people who require that to be something everyone believes or not? That's the whole oh, point. I know. So that's what I like about this, Charlie. Belief is not, uh, it's not like a code of theology, something very personal to your experience and your, and your life. Very, you know, and that's interesting you would use the word code because I have, um, just of late in overcoming my past, part of it is reconstructing my code. 
my code, you, you know, once I had a very free and open code, I, I joined at 30 years old the Christian tradition, and, you know, there's stronger codes of things that I don't know that I still buy exactly the code. And Jesus dealt with it. He used the word Sabbath, and then right. St. Paul uses the word law. I use the word code. And right. Jesus wrote that um, humans were not made to serve the code. The right. code was made to serve humans. And if we take a look at it that way, it's not it's not strict obedience to the code. It's what does the code tell you about the that, beauty and yeah. essence of the divine? And that's my first response about anything theological is the paradigm shift. Is what matters here? Does the code itself matter and you're sent to it? Or tell me what it does for you. Because if some if I say to someone Okay, you believe whatever it is, virgin birth, you know, the deity of Christ, any of those things. Sure. But what? Tell me what that does for you. It's on Monday morning. What difference does that make? And you just answered that for me. So, but the point is, most people go, "What? Are you kidding me? I, I got the answer right. Who cares what it does for me?" But then we got an issue. Yeah, Seth Godin does. Um, I'm real. I'm reading Seth Godin. You know, and I'm. Sort of a quasi fan of Seth Godin. I think he's a pretty wise man, and he has this new book called Song of Significance, and he talks about um, what were we just talking about? Virgin birth, theological something, certainty. Well, never mind what he talks about. I forgot. But no, that's the that's the best part about this kind of conversation is, um, is that. W- uh, it was really good until we forgot what it was. <laughs> until we turned 74. I'm calling myself 74. I'm still two months away. But I, because I, I, Joseph Campbell, he's he's one of my people too. You mentioned yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the, 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 my favorite Joseph Campbell story is like he, I forget where he was, but he was, he was talking, I, I think he was teaching something in Japan, but anyway, there was a Shinto priest, right? And so Campbell says to the Shinto priest, you know, in our religion, we have a bunch of great lot of ceremonies, too, and, you know, we have, and so I've been to a lot of your ceremonies, and I've seen a lot of your shrines, but then Campbell says, but I don't get your ideology and, or your theology. So this Japanese priest says to Campbell, we don't have an ideology, and we don't have a theology, we dance. Love that. If it doesn't affect personally how I how I live this day, doesn't it's not really of impact. I can, yeah, I yeah. Really or I'm doing a course on Richard Rohr, and I know my listeners have got to be saying, "Are you reading anybody else besides Richard Rohr?" Mm-hmm. And I'm doing this long course. I'm I'm sort of a guinea pig in a. Mm-hmm. 12 week course that needs to be reduced a lot but I I'm there's so much that I'm getting out of it uh, it's an excellent course just kind of long and filled with lots of material but Richard talks about the influential power of story and much to the ire of the very conservative Christian wing the veracity it's not that it's not important. I'm going to say it's not important, but but it doesn't hold. It, it it doesn't hold the influence of the power of the story. It is the story. It is not this factual event. That this factual Agreed. event. I can't believe because that's very that's very post enlightenment age of reasoning thinking. I've got to prove it. I've, I've got it, you know, and how can you prove it when there's only one book? There's no resources other other that that are that are going to um, that are going to to justify it or verify it or or add to it. But it is, I th- I think I think belief in the unbelievable has there's influential power of the story, the story of the resurrection, the story of the virgin birth, the story of the miracle at Cana. You know, so many of these stories are so impacting 
that they are what keeps us going. It is this right brain, you know, sort of acceptance of the beauty of these stories. Tell me what you think about about the great biblical theological in store influence of stories as opposed to fact. Oh, uh, I, uh, well, for, for starters, story. When you talk story, do you, do you remember for the first miniseries I, way back in the day, Roots? Do you remember Roots? Yes, of course. Yes. Kunta Kinte or whatever it is. Yes, yes. Do you remember that every episode of that that went through generations, uh, the father sat down with the son and said, what? I need to tell you a story. That's how it began. I need to tell you a story. Which is exactly, which is exactly what Scripture is. It's each one saying, okay, I need to tell you a story. I'm telling you a story. And the story gets passed on. Because what the story is, it invites you to embrace the reality of being a part of this. We're here. We're part of this. Yes, and it impacts everything we do. And it, you know, this this it becomes because it we, because we internalize that. Now. Yes, it becomes an essential part of our of our belief system. Everything. If you take it away from story and simply uh, the the creedal kind of element, it's simply somewhere in my head that I simply make a check mark about. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, I'm so with you on check marks. And now I know what Seth Godin said. He, he and, and this fits right in here. And Seth Godin was talking about um, formal education of the young. And it's all about giving right answers to the tests taking notes and following rules. It's not about creative thinking. It's not about dealing with life issues. It's, it's just about being able to answer the test and, and get the right answers. And, and okay, so we have education about that, but what it does from six years old is it teaches us a paradigm of right answers. And that's what, and that's what you are, you're rewarded for. And everything having to do with church, too. And the story I've told for years, my favorite story of the Sunday school class, where the kids are acting up and they're first graders and they're acting up. Sunday school teacher's going nuts and she needs to drink. It's just <laughs> not a fun thing to do. And so she's shouting at the kids, settle down. And, she said, and then she says, okay, let's play a game uh, that'll settle you down. I'll describe something to you. Tell me what it is. It's a furry little animal with a big bushy tail, climbs up trees and stores nuts in the winter. And Sunday school yeah. class, nobody says anything. And she says, "Come on, we're a really good Sunday school class. It's a furry little animal with a big bushy tail, climbs up trees and stores nuts in the winter." The little, raise, little kid raises his hand, and the teacher says, "Yeah." And he says, "Teacher, it sounds like a squirrel to me, but I'm going to say Jesus." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that and that is the being right. Exactly. In other words, did I get it? Did I get it? Yeah, yeah she. He, oh, Seth, just, Seth tells a story of, of a six-year-old that was taught a six-year-old that was taught if they are required if they are quiet during class, they get merits and a treat. They get some piece of candy, and oh. she was terrible, could not go to school because she was afraid she would get demerits and wouldn't get a candy because she knew she was going right. to talk that day. Right, yeah. That's terrible. Okay, we're going to, we're, we're moving on. Uh, I, my transitions um, are not really adequate, but um, here's another thing I was reading. Maria Popova in the Marginalian used to be brain pickings. And she wrote of a Pulitzer Prize winner, Wolfgang Pauli, who was very close to Carl Jung. And there and Wolfgang Pauli was a um, particle physicist. And Wolfgang Pauli Pauli had an interest in the meaning of life but it had to come from a scientific perspective, and Carl Jung 
had a meaning of life that came from archetypal sort of sort of um, his form of of psychology or psychiatry. And here in a letter to Carl Jung, here's what Wolfgang Pauli wrote, and and I'm quoting. He inferred that meaning, now this is a whole different subject, everybody. We're talking about meaning. And Pauli said to Carl Jung, meaning is not a fundamental function of reality, but an interpretation superimposed by the human observer. Um, so what he's saying is that, that, the, that the physical universe is neutral. There is no meaning to the physical universe. It is just doing what it's supposed to do and advancing and growing and doing all that. But there is, there is no, for the spirit, for, for, the, for the physical universe, there is no meaning. But the meaning, we impose meaning. Meaning is something that is not According to Pauli, according to a physicist, it is not essential. It, it, is, it is not, you know, an ontological existence in the universe. Now, if we deal in a spiritual world, in another, there, there, you know, we can easily see meaning. But I like this idea of superimposing, of that we, cre- we create the meaning of life. And so many of us, and so many people that we know, are trying to discover the meaning of life. When I think a better, a better verb would be to recognize the meaning of your life in the midst of your environment. Yes. Yeah. Got me there. I mean, because anything we have to label and shelve, that this is the point of it. It sometimes just makes me a laugh or smile real big. That um, um, whenever we say, even if we have, for example, even if you have a, a relational dynamic, you get together with your son and someone says, what was it? And you say, but you say, but what did it mean? In other words, you're thinking, wait a minute. Does a moment of gladness it's not carry its own weight? It's not uh, a, a pang of joy, not carry its own weight. Does not a dose of beauty not carry its own weight. Does not smile on the spirit and the soul not carry its own weight. What's wrong with just letting that be? That be. Yeah, you you really are an existentialist, and um... I'm uh, unbelievably so. And the whole point is. It, and as soon as I personally have to think, where do I frame this? Yes. Oh my God! Settle down, child. Yes, because there, the there's there's an assumption that there is a meaning lying out there waiting for us, and our and job some, on some Earth is to other, discover it. Uh, yeah. And some meaning other than the fact that your heart came alive and your soul was refreshed. You need to name it. I love that. I love that. So and hey, and you know what? I'm thinking. You know what carries that forward? It's not that the fact that I that I tell you uh, wh- what my theological criteria are for that. It's that when my soul is refreshed, and I tell you the story. We keep telling the story. Just tell the stories. Yeah, because there, you know, what is more true than story? Exactly, the story. And especially the personal story. story. Even though it's recollected incorrectly, we never remember correctly what the past said, what we did. But there is something that goes to a different part of our, part of our brain rather than our rigidity and that it must fit into some category. It fits into a larger experiential cauldron of which all of these wonders are being stirred together and we are we are gaining wisdom and love and life and joy from that. Now that's a great 
It's a good metaphor, stirred together. It's a, it's a cooking metaphor, which I like immensely. That's great. Yeah, I, you know, so I, I think I think my conclusion on this one, and, and it's becoming my conclusion on a lot of things, Terry, and that's the distinction between discovery and recognition. That we really don't discover things. Things have been true in our life for our whole life, and at some point in time we recognize it. And we say, True. Ah. Yeah, we see it. We see it. Oh, I see that now. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, I, I was not officially a Christian until I was 30 years old. Does that mean God had nothing to do with my life for 29 years? Right. No. That means, for me, it tells me the story that God was involved in my life for 29 years, I just did not respect or not not recognize deity. It's right. just that I didn't discover deity at 30 years old. I recognized it. Ah, no shit. This has been going along for forever. This is not a new. This is not a new discovery. This is just a recognition of a truth that has gone on for a long time. No, that's actually a sermon that I think that would be a great sermon title about anything, you know, something about affirmation of the spiritual and the present, and the sermon title is, oh, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you tell me. Now you tell me. Now you tell me. Okay, I got a, I got, I got more. I got another one that I was reading uh, in Seth Godin's book. The song of the song of significance, and it's 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 a business book, and it's it's all about all about teams and what's going on with teams. But believe me, has a lot of life implications in there. And um, he was talking about this quote that we were just talking about, it of meaning being superimposed by some human observer. And then in the midst of it, somehow he quoted. He was very close with Zig Ziglar. And I think he was a disciple of Zig Ziglar that the two of them did several several gigs together and talked together and worked together. And, he, and, and this is his quote of Zig, so I can't say this is a Zig quote, but this is a Seth Godin quote of Zig Ziglar that says, um, Life will be whatever it will be. Uh, I... I'd like to just stop there and that we think, we pretend that we are in control of what life is going to be. But, you know, Terry, after 70 years, I know that's not true. I'm in control of nothing. You know, things just happen and I follow along and and adjust and try to deal with it lovingly and, and kindly. But he said, here's what Zig said, and this is a very Zig Ziglar Quote, so it was, life will be whatever it will be. However, if we approach life positively, it's going to be a whole lot better. Well, I th- yeah, okay. What that speaks to is because you're, you, in your comments, that speaks to is um, life will be what it will be. Yes. I have choices. I have choices about how I live in that life. Yes. You know, we talked about being a victim. I can be a victim. Yes. No, I would say that's probably not a good choice. Okay? Agree. Uh, in other words, there are ways that I can choose how I'm going to live with this life. In other words, am I going to be a person that uh, makes this life, embraces others, that includes others? Am I going to be a person who is a victim? Am I going to be a person who feels demeaned and therefore demeans others? In other words, there are choices I can make. Experiences I have, I don't have. I'm, yes, it's going. Th- things are what they are. So now, um, in my own skin, what choices do I make with this? Am I okay with making those choices? I so concur with choice. You know, um, I know you read my blogs, and so you know that probably at least every third or fourth blog, there's something about choice in it. You know, I'm very Victor, Victor Frankel in choice, and and you you know what it occurred to me as I was thinking of Zig's statement and and Seth's statement that 
we can't control or predict life but through our approach through our 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 um, choices we can influence it we can influence in a direction but we're never even then we're never even sure that that's going to happen because life is going to be what it's going to be but we can influence our life and 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 it's not a small it's not a small disregarded influence we can have a we can have a huge influence but that but but that is not there is no guarantee to that so i, I like that if if we make a good choice and we think about it positively we think about it with hope life has a whole different face if we if we if if we construct lenses that we can see life through through different glasses, then it's a, we're a lot better off than we're thinking about it, than if thinking about it in negative and self-abusive, self-flagellation, or judgmental of other people. Anytime somebody does something, we're judging of it. If we can just, if we can, we just chill and accept. Acceptance is, a, is in, in acceptance in relationship, I think, is... A very underemphasized word to me. It's acceptance in a relationship may be one of the very utmost key factors in that relationship. Accepting what part of it? What do you mean? Accepting the other person. Thank you for clarifying. Oh, oh. I, I'm, oh, I'm oh, thinking. Yeah. I'm thinking of my wife and I, and that we have. A, you know, there's a couple of issues that we have. We are you really don't mean to accept. You don't mean to accept. You mean. Actually, there's something about embracing rather than accepting. And you're embracing who she is. I'm embracing who she is, and even though yeah. I may disagree with her tactics, yeah, well, I oh, accept yeah. those tactics because they're coming from a good place in her. And exactly. we doesn't mean we don't talk about it, doesn't mean we don't disagree with it, but it is not an ontological disagreement. I'm not saying your character, your nature is flawed is just that you have different ideas based on a different history of experience and dna and and all of that and and i must respect and accept that that is who you are and so i am not going to reject you for those positions i may not agree with them but it has nothing to do with well, that's the whole thing about any of that is that in other words if if you're at a home in your own skin not going to take that personally that's the whole difference if you're at home in your own skin it doesn't tell you who you are and so that therefore what that means you get to choose who get to choose which is the whole point yeah and 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 i choose love correct and if i choose okay. love there is an acceptance of the strengths and and I can't even say they're misguided or wrong or anything because that's that's all my value system. That's not her value system. And so I have to I have to understand to accept not just what she does, but her value system as equally as valid as mine. Okay, next question and this is this is this is I really picked one in your sweet zone. I'm curious about this because you are obviously an avid gardener. What about gardening? What is it about gardening that makes it such a fabulous metaphor for life? I know few things that are more of a metaphor for life than gardening. What has gardening taught you? How has gardening, maybe let me ask it this way, how has gardening led you to experience and, and, and wallowing in, in the present with, with good attitudes? Well, uh, I, I, mean, I'm, I mean, I wasn't always a garden lover because I always thought about it as, you know, something, assignment I had to do as a kid, you know, so it was fun, but um. Gardening, um, for me, so make it a bigger picture, though, Charlie. Let's just talk nature, walking, parks. Um, it's, we talk about this with the emotional well-being of different cities in the United States. 
a lot of it is is predicated on how many parks they have and whether people use them. It's about being in nature. It's a big deal that I have in Orange County, which is why when you talked about going to Laguna Beach, you're talking nature. So all of a sudden, everything shifts. You're in nature. The thing about gardening for me is it really does, really does park me, park me in the present. And you know, and the thing about gardening is I can, it can not necessarily be a fun present, especially if you look at the weeds and whatever you mm-hmm. need to do. But the thing about gardening is all of your senses are alive and you're simply here in the moment. That feeds you in a way that you did not know was possible. Um, when I was in one of my therapists, I forget, back in the day when I was moving up here and doing my thing, and, and I said, you know, I was like, tell, tell me why I'm in therapy. He said, because it'll make you a better gardener. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you know what reminds me also of gardening, that, that, that I think I am personally moved in gardening by the soil, and it's a preparation of the soil, and it's the weeding, and it's the taking care. You know, there is a there is a a maintenance factor that is essential in life because we we need to prepare our soil, do we not, in order that we can. If 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 yeah, that's if, a book, uh, a book I almost wrote was the title was going to be called "The Dirt Matters" because it's all literally it's about the dirt. You put your money in the dirt. It's not about the plants because I make a distinction when I have conversations with people. The distinction between landscaping and gardening. Landscaping is for public opinion, for public viewing. Gardening is what's the expression of your heart and spirit. It's gardening. I know. Do you remember? Do you remember when you did my house and you made? Do you remember the private garden, the secret garden? Of course I do. Yeah. Yeah. It was just. It was so beautiful. I mean, and it was in, in plain sight, except it was at the far end of one of the gardens, so you couldn't right away see the entrance to it but there were as a tree we made a bench out of and it was just yeah well the key is the key is the bench part in other words spend your time there that's the deal it's not just something you looked at it's the tree it's the best yeah well i have more but i tell you what i wanted to talk about but we i don't think we will i wanted to talk about wabasabi are you very interested in that japanese word I don't know. It's not something I know. It so. is things imperfect, impermanent, oh, yeah, right, and right, incomplete. Right, right, right. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, I yeah. do know. And now I remember it. Yes. Yeah, and those are. Um, that's that's probably a a, a show unto itself. Um, it, it it's it's powerful. But I think we will. I think we will wrap up our just saying. With those topics we have um, we have covered, and and it's and, it, and it, you, you know you know what's been fun, Hirsch, is that it's been in a time for you to ponder and explore. I think that that it's great for our listeners to see you, you know, just to creatively embrace a direction we're going. I mean, you're you're already all, always creatively embracing, but this is sort of different. It wasn't. It's not in a lecture format. Oh, but th- you know what? Th- that's the thing is, people, the invitation for anybody to give themselves space to have conversations, because the conversations then, in, in turn, take space just for learning, growing, acknowledging, laughing, crying, learn. You know, it's all about that. And you know what we didn't get into that, um, you know, just because, you know, some things are appropriate for air and some things are not but the number of things that we disagree on I don't know if disagree is the right word Terry it's that we just have a different window that we see things from but that you know the beauty of this relationship is that we can talk openly and candidly about that and non-judgmentally even though there may be some I can't believe you believe that shit you know but um, it is you know, it's a whole different subject, but we need more of that in our country. Is that? Uh, would argue. Let's do a show on that. We need more of that. I agree with you. Okay, we'll do a show on that. I, yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, just, I mean, 
100%, Charles. All right, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for uh, doing this for me today. I know our listeners super appreciate you on the show. Um, I get fine comments when you are on the show. Thank you for being on with us. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Okay, let me thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.